and welcome you again to our first Zoom broadcast for the ICA USA. Uh, I'd like to introduce our host today, who is our board chair and a longtime supporter and leader within the ICA USA, Margaret Gergen. Uh, Margaret and Leslie's uh, screens will be pinned so that you can see the uh, conversation going back and forth between the two of them. Uh, we hope that you enjoy the conversation. And Margaret, if you would be so kind as to maybe give a quick introduction of Ms. Showers, I'm gonna move out of the screen and Leslie's gonna replace me here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Um, I have in the past been known to say that Leslie is a serial overachiever. She's heard me say that several times, but um, not content with one degree. Leslie has two, one in broadcast communications and one in architecture, both of which um, serve the ICA USA very well. She also has two amazing sons um, who are adults, grown up, figuring out everything they need to know about their lives and doing very well. And she is rightfully very proud of them. Um, Leslie has been with the ICA USA for 12 years. And again, in two positions um, as our chief operating officer, and now most recently as our executive director. And we are thrilled to have Leslie bring her skills and expertise and background um, from two very successful entrepreneurial independent businesses um, that she fostered, grew, and then turned over to other people to do very successfully. So we are the beneficiaries of all of that experience. Leslie, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I want to start off by talking a little bit about TOP. Um, most of the people who are uh, listening in and joining this call know about our technology of participation program, one of our signature programs, or TOP, as we call it. Leslie, tell us a little bit about how COVID has uh, had an impact on TOP and what the long range implications of that might be? Wow, that's a good question. First, Margaret, thanks for the introduction. Um, I appreciate it. Like you always do, <laughs> you, you give me more credit than I think I need. But anyway, um, for most of you know that we have a global network of top trainers um, and facilitate. That's and what I wanted to like <laughs> When um, COVID hit other industries, it hit that network very hard too. But we've got a lot of people who are very imaginative and very um, inventive, and they did a good job pivoting. And what they did was they took it from face to face and they put it online, just like everybody else did. But they got the software, the wherewithal the collaboration so that they continue to train um, online, which is just beautiful to me. But what it does is that when we were only doing it face to face, we had what was called top deserts. There were areas in the states where there weren't any trainers. And so those people weren't being saved. By pivoting, not only have they reinvented and they were able to continue, but now they can reach those people in those top deserts too. So I think for the future of top of the network, marketing is going to get better. We'll get those methods out to a whole lot of other folks who weren't able to get them. I think that they just really, because of COVID, made themselves much stronger. 
and ICA is really supporting that uh, network too. So I would say kudos to the top trainers and the top network for Absolutely. their uh, innovations and resilience. That's terrific and filled with possibilities. Yeah. Um, another area that we all have heard about for uh, quite some time is the Green Rise Restoration Project. And I know that has been uh, quite a journey for you, for everyone else. Um, tell us a little bit about what the current status is of the GRRP. -E that does not roll off the tongue so easily, um, as well as um, what the journey has been, where it has taken us, uh, where it's taken you and all of those involved with it. So um, I will say that this has been a seven year journey. So for me, GRRP just rolls right off the tongue. I've been saying <laughs> it for seven years now. It's very easy. Um, the current status is, is that we have about 80% of our capital stack committed. And with that 80%, we are pushing for a first closing in September, which is really a huge, huge, huge success and announcement. We're very excited about that. Um, this has been an extremely difficult capital stack. We have about 20% left to go but we are sure that we can get that while we're in construction, which is why we're doing two closings. We wanna get started. It's been seven years and I'm really anxious if nobody else is, okay? But this journey has been a, a long journey of great lessons, of great contacts, of learning how to navigate uh, this financial model for someone in our situation, and then taking all of these learnings and putting them in one area so that we can help somebody else that wants to do this. I mean, it is almost unbelievable that a nonprofit that has this type of commitment to the climate crisis and knows that building is, buildings are a big contributor has to go through these steps to get it done. But we were willing to go through these steps to get it done. Because like we always say, we're a demonstration, right? So now that we've done that, we've got a roadmap of how to do it, what to do, what not to do, when to get started, all of that. And we can take all of that information and help other uh, buildings, whether they're nonprofits or a community center, a church, whatever it may be, we have that knowledge and now we can help others with it. So more specifically in terms of sharing that knowledge, um, tell us a little bit about uh, the carbon free building demonstration and um, how that's working, what is involved with it, who's participating, and then what the possibilities are for a national impact. So one of the things about this journey that we've been on is that we've gained a lot of knowledge. We know the climate crisis is, is real. I mean, just think about it. I think it was 2008, maybe 2006, when Al, Gore, Al Gore's in, in, Inconvenient Truth, that was it, thank you, um, came out. And everything that he said, everything that he said in that film has come true, right? We've had last week, every day, someplace in the country, recorded the hottest day in history for them, right? Our storms are worse than ever. We've got wildfires going on, not just in this country now, in the world, it is crazy. This is a crisis, right? 
And I was listening to Al Gore this Sunday talk about it. And he's like, you know what? It's going to take grassroots initiatives to help this along. And it is. And that's what ICA is good at, right? We carbon-free building demonstration came out of a need of other buildings in Uptown that wanted to do exactly what we were doing, but had no idea how to do it and where to go and get help. A lot of these buildings came to us. A lot we went after. But now we have a collaborative of six buildings. They're all different types from a high school to a residential to affordable housing. We're a mixed use building. All of us are going on this journey together. We have together, we are making a master plan on how we can get these buildings carbon free or carbon neutral by 2035. Okay. We've gone through the process, meaning ICA has, and we're helping these others along, bringing resources that we've gathered along the way. Um, and then together, we're gonna create a toolkit so that hopefully we can take this toolkit to other communities so that they can start the process uh, along too. We've got to move. I mean, this, this crisis is not gonna do anything until we start moving. The implications for this nationally is that we're also in collaboration with Ithaca, New York. And Ithaca, New York is half the size of Uptown. And they have declared and put in policy that they will be carbon neutral by 2030. They've already started. They've done a lot of financing for this. They've got a lot of community outreach behind them. Their mayor is behind them. And so we're collaborating with them. We're finding out how we can partner along with other states that they're partnering with too, so that we can duplicate this. What we're trying to do is we're trying to make it easy for other states, cities to duplicate this. And so we're in those conversations right now. So speaking of their mayor, um talk a little bit about our mayor and the city of Chicago and what kind of support uh, this has uh, from the city. Well, the ICA um, was in, participated in conversations last summer uh, on policy around uh, the city being carbon free. Um, we gained a lot of support in those conversations and in that network. Um, I already had a lot of existing friends in there. I worked very closely with Doug Farr, who ha also happens to be the architect on our project here. Um, Angela Tovar, the chief sustainability officer. And Angela put our project in front of the mayor. Angela believes in this project. She believes in what we're trying to do in Uptown. And so she put our project in front of the mayor. And thank God the mayor was interested enough to come out and take a look at this project and see what was going on. So she came out Earth Day, whether it was, you know, an Earth Day event or not, she came out, she was very helpful. She was very interested. She is the one that helped us along in getting city financing for this project. Terrific. That's just great. Um, so as to reducing the carbon footprint, certainly one of the movements in that direction is this whole area of housing, tiny houses, shared housing, um, intentional communities. I know that uh, there has been some discussion about the eighth floor of the Green Rise and the possibility of some affordable housing um, development or program in that regard. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you see that as part of the future of the ICA? Sure. So. Uptown 
And a lot of people who live in Uptown and have been here a long time would still say that Uptown is one of the most diverse communities in the city of Chicago. Economically, culturally, socially, they would say it still is. But like so many other communities in the city of Chicago, it is, gentrification is pushing its way in. And we're left with almost two types of cultures here, right? We, it, it's like everything else, the economic pushes out the social and, and the uh, other one, anyway, you know what I mean. So we've got gentrification and we've got a very vulnerable population. And so this very vulnerable population has been here. This is their home. They've lived here all of their lives. But because gentrification is pushing in, a lot of the buildings that used to house these people have been turned into luxury condominiums. So where are they going to go? That's why we have such a very large tent city in the parks over here, under the viaducts over here, because we are not looking at a solution to that. And Uptown has always been known, one, as a refugee center, two, as having social services to help that very vulnerable population. But it's being pushed out. We're still here. I'm very proud that we are part of the Four Corners that is preserving affordable housing and keeping those services here. But we've got to think as a community more creative about helping this vulnerable population, of helping the homeless, right? I think our intentional communities are a very creative way of doing that because our intentional communities, and we have two in this building, the Green Rise Intentional Community and Praxis, both of them have, have done something that a lot of developers have tried to do. And they've mixed cultures, they've mixed economic groups, they've mixed all of them together and been very successful at it, right? Because what has happened is there's been a community, a natural community that exists with services, natural services to help. I think that is the future of our very vulnerable population. Not putting them in a whole bunch of single occupancy rooms that take up a lot of energy and, and it's, you have to do a lot of building for that, but to create a community that has natural wraparound services. So ICA is trying to address that issue in our own community and is thinking about a way of addressing it on the eighth floor, whether it be another intentional community, whether it be some kind of creative affordable housing program that's going up there, but we have dedicated and committed a whole committee on what's gonna happen with that. How can we contribute and help that issue in Uptown? And by doing so, again, that's a more sustainable way. Right. Not only does it save energy, but it also sustains the people that live there too. So when I say creative, that's that's what I mean. Terrific. So Leslie, these are a lot of exciting initiatives. Um, some that have uh, been with us for years and are coming to fruition. Some that are new and moving forward. Um, as you look at your first six months as executive director, um, what's been the experience besides a bit of a roller coaster? <laughs> roller coaster it's been too. Um, you know, I think in my first six months, what, what has really hit me and what, what the staff and I have done is finally have a story about the organization of ICA as one. Not a story about the building and then the programs at ICA, but a story that combines these into one mission that the organization is doing. Um, and having buy-in from all the staff for that too is very important because we, we've got a building that we're using as a demonstration and we do programming out of it. It's one and the same. And I think finally there's an understanding that it's one and the same. 
that's going to propel us far into the future. That's terrific, Leslie. I think um, certainly the board has uh, captured this vision and this understanding that uh, the Green Rise project is not only to preserve a landmark building or to um, protect an asset, um, but is in fact part of and an integral part of our mission that um, the tenants, the programs, um, not only move our um, long-term mission of justice and equity forward, but add the component of resilience, of stewardship, and um, of sustainability, both for um, buildings and bricks and mortar, as well as human beings, mm -hmm. um, all of whom need to be sustained. Mm -hmm. um, Couldn't say who's better. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so I'd like to open the floor to questions. I see a note from Jim Weagle that uh, 2035 seems like lots of slowness in these endeavors. <laughs> Quite a different pace for both ICA and top practitioners, isn't it? Um, how well, would you I, respond? I, it, it does seem 2035 to me seems like a very ambitious goal, Jim. I hear you. I hear you. But to do this work and do it at the level that we're doing it, it's not just buildings that we have to change, right? We have to change cultures too. We have to change people's mindsets of why they have to do it and why it's important to them and that they can do it. And it's not gonna you know, mess up the way they cook dinner or you know, heat, heat their homes or something. So it's one and the same. We could get those buildings electrified and really quick with some money, but we also have to help change the culture too. And the culture is the important part. One of the uh, sort of aha and a bit of a shock moment for me was when um, Mark McMullen Bushman, one of our board members mentioned that in Boulder, Colorado, their goal is one, I believe it's one, 55 gallon drum of garbage per family per week and everything else to be recycled, composted, reused um, toward a sustainable city. Um, when I think about how many bags of garbage I take <laughs> to our uh, trash container a week, I'm challenged and embarrassed. And yeah. that has been kind of a, a watchword for me. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, that's another thing about community. It's the Green Rice community is always thinking that way, right? Right now they started composting, which is really cool. They have this um, pledge to not use plastic. It's hard, but you know, I know I'm trying. My recycling goes in a paper bag now. But that's what I mean by community, right? Community can help change culture and culture can help change this climate crisis. Right. So I see a question, a couple of questions from Jim Troxell asking if uh, Irv Henderson and Ted Waisaki are still working on the Green Rise Restoration Project and how they're doing. Um, Ted and Irv, we are all joined at the hip. So mm -hmm. right before this meeting, we were joined at the hip. We continue to be joined at the hip. We will be joined at the hip until we complete this. And we're trying to complete this so that Ted can finally be, um, what, what does Ted think he is right now? He thinks he's, what does he think he okay. yeah I don't remember 
the word escaped me because it's not true. Right? Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. So, but no, they're doing great. They're working hard. Um, Irv has been to Chicago a couple of times. Um, he's still working hard on this. I tell you, I don't know if Ted, Irv, and I will be standing once closing date is over with. We're probably both all going to just lay down somewhere for a week. So the next question uh, is that uh, Jim got the impression that all of top training is being done virtually. And he's asking if any are being done in person now. Now that some of the CDC um, mandates and laws and stuff recommendations have uh, lifted, yes, Jim, there are some in-person uh, training sessions going on now. In fact, one of our um, community members, and I know you know him well, is traveling back and forth doing uh, in-person meetings. So I think that's fantastic. Great. Uh, Carlton Stock is asking about the spiritual dimension in the whole operation. I think, Carlton, I think by one of the things that Karen Troxell and I are doing, it's a gem that we got from Ithaca, is we're creating this advisory committee for carbon-free building demonstration, which now is going to be carbon-free building demonstration uptown, because we're trying to get uptown uh, carbon neutral. And in this advisory committee, we are looking at the community residents, we're looking at um, other nonprofits, we're looking at government officials, we're looking at everybody that has their hands in this community. We're looking at people who deal with the very vulnerable community and we're looking at them as well to be on this advisory committee because for us, for ICA right now where it is, it's very important that what we do, we're preserving, we're having those voices in there and we're starting with that most vulnerable population first. We're doing this to make sure that they have the same opportunities that the big developers do, or that these lux these people that live in luxury condominiums do. And for me, that is taking care, um, great care of that population. For me, uh, spiritually, and I'm I'm speaking truly spiritual. I'm I'm thinking, speaking from my relationship. Um, that is what my goal is, is to make sure that that vulnerable population is taken care of. And in doing so, I think all of us are doing that. So it's the human factor in community development uh, in, an, in it, it is, it is the old the human form factor. and the new For form. For me, it's very spiritual, but yes, it is the human factor in community development. So I think we have reached our 30 minute time frame. Um, we would love to hear from all of you about topics that you would like us to take up mm -hmm. uh, for future Zoom casts. Um, if you have a subject, email Leslie at L showers, period, at, right? No, L showers at ICA-USA.org. Or you can email me at uh, chair at ICAUSA.org. So yeah. love wanna, to hear from you. Yeah. I want to thank all of you. It's been um, an interesting ride being part of this staff. Now it's a, another interesting ride being the executive director, but like Margaret said, we are very interested in hearing from you. So thank you all. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it.
Take care. Bye, everyone. Now.